All right, well, uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, Phaedra office hours session. Um, unfortunately, Nico Carver can't make it today, but uh, Sydney and I are here and we have some uh, really great uh, guests today to speak about their work. Um, so yeah, my name is Katie Fry. I'm assistant head librarian and I've been working on Project Phaedra for many years, um, mostly kind of on the, the back end, like making sure the boxes are getting down to imaging services to get you know, photographed and then getting all their metadata in the system and all of that. Um, and Sydney, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, thanks, Katie. Um, I'm Sydney. Uh, I'm the Assistant Community Coordinator for Project Phaedra. So I also do a lot of back end stuff um, with social media um, and with working with volunteers. Um, and I also check all the notifications on Star Notes. So I've been seeing everything you guys have been tagging uh, and everything you've been saying about the new phase. So definitely keep the questions coming. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm there to answer them. And yeah, it's been really cool. So that's, yeah, that's me. All right, and today we have Elizabeth Coquelet and Samantha Nautic um, from the Harvard College Observatory Plate Stacks, their Plate Stacks Curator Assistants, and we'd ask them to speak about their work. And um, I also see that we have uh, Meta Partenheimer here, and she is also a Plate Stacks Curator Assistant. Um, I'm not sure if she intends to speak, but I'll just leave that option available if she's interested. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it on over to the uh, the plate stacks. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Samantha, as Katie said, um, and uh, I'm really happy to be able to come on here and talk about what we've been doing, tell you guys about it. Um, we thought we'd start off with how this got started, um, kind of how the, the BIOS project became a project. Um, in the plate stacks, as you can see behind me, there is uh, tons and tons of glass plates, and some of those are lantern slides. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, some of them are lantern slides used for presentations uh, and teaching to, as teaching tools. Um, and so we had a specific small collection of them that one particular um, woman who worked in the plate stacks used when she was an instructor uh, to teach celestial navigation. And, oh, Meta says, it's true to observe and be excited. Um, she used these uh, lantern slides to teach when she taught celestial navigation and uh, we still have them. And my one of my other jobs, I have one other job um, and I work at a maritime museum. And so uh, our acting curator at the time thought, you know, oh, you work at a maritime place, you'll know some of the things that might be on the lantern slides possibly. Um, I don't think I knew more than you know, the average person, but uh, I still inventoried them and got started researching her specifically. Ah, there we go. Um, and so she was the first one uh, that we that I did a formal bio on and she was um, kind of the, the guinea pig a little bit for the structure that we ended up creating and, and the, the methodology of, of coming up with these, of creating these bios. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen if I can, and show you guys uh, where we're at with our master list. So when we started this, when I started with her, we didn't really have a solid list of how many women had worked in the plate stacks, had been, you know, computers, assistants, astronomers um, that had come through over the years. Um, so that was one of our first tasks was finding all from all different sources, lists of women that had worked here. One that one was made by a previous curator. Um, some were made by previous directors of the Harvard College Observatory. Um, so let me show you guys this. And Elizabeth, you should jump in at some point and talk us through what this looks like. Can everybody see this? Yeah, cool. All right. So. Yeah. Should I explain the, okay, yes. So, yeah, jump right in. Um, this is our bios master list. Um, and so we got this list of women. There's a variety of different sources that have lists of women who work, you know, in the stacks in various sort of capacities. So 
the two most sort of official sources were there was a um, printed thing in, I believe it was 1904, printed by Harvard with the staff members that had the first maybe 10 or so women on it. And then um, Solon Bailey, who was a director of the Harvard College Observatory for a short period of time, wrote a history of the Harvard College Observatory that was published in 1931, but it um, had all of the staff and the dates they were there up to 1927. So there's those two, those two things. And then also the former uh, curator of the plate stacks, um, Lindsay Smith Azrol, she had done an article where she had gotten names of women and she had actually gone through like blog books and um, plate jackets and stuff and taken when people's names were on it, taken out like, well, her name was on this work at this date, um, those sorts of things. So her, her list was a little more general, it was like more widely defined. So I didn't keep everything on that list, but I kept a lot of it. So all of these people are people who worked in astronomy, um, did astronomy related technical work at the Harvard College Observatory for, you know, at least a couple of years. Um, or I guess, yeah, at least I think probably most of them are a minimum of a year or two. Some are up to like 30 or 40 years. So um, yeah, so we have the dates here and then there's a separate um, page that says, cause some of the sources had different sets of dates. So as far as we could, we confirm dates. And then also there's a separate page that has like the actual sourcing for who said what. Um, and then, so something that was complicated was uh, maiden names versus married names. Um, so yeah, and one thing that was interesting is that there was a lot of women who worked at the observatory and then stopped when they got married. So they only used their maiden name while at the observatory, but often in later lists were referred to by their married name, even though like their professional work was done under their maiden name. And um, there's a few who only did professional work under their married name. And then there's some who did work under both. And interestingly, those are primarily women who married other astronomers. Um, yeah, so we wanted to make sure that on the list we had all of the names that were used for professional work. So if they used primarily their maiden name, we did, we'd say, um, so here like Barbara Cherry Schwarzschild. So we wrote that as Barbara Cherry and then parentheses Schwarzschild. So the name she used professionally and then, um, and then the other name she used not professionally. And then for women who only use their um, married name professionally, like Imogen Willis Eddy, for instance. So we have that as Imogen W. Eddy, nay Willis um, on the list. And then for women who use both, we have both on the list. And so because it gets a little complicated in terms of which name people are using, especially when, I mean, some women had like they they use their full name regularly, like Helen Sawyer Hogg, but some would not use like their maiden name as their middle name. So sometimes you'd see them referred to as only the one or only the other. And we wanted it to be able to be something that you could find anyone on the list. It wasn't like you're looking at the wrong name or something like that. So because of the complexity of that, we decided to list them in um, alphabetical order of first name. And then, yeah, so where we know middle names, we put the initial and then the names listed not in parentheses are all names that were used while they were um, doing professional work. Awesome, yeah. And we had little X's here if we know that they never got married um, or for one reason or another. Um, so that's an awesome transition. Uh, because making this list allowed us to have both a count, but also be able to start, well, the thing is blocking it, um, to start updating our website uh, with all of this new information that we had, all of the, the updated list of names. So this is on the Wolbeck Library website. You click on glass plates, and you click on women at the Harvard College Observatory. Um, so this is viewable to everybody at home if you want to follow along or just watch what I do. Um, 
So we have sort of background information in general, when they started, who started it, who was some of the funders. Um, and we have a bunch of our funders, uh, Catherine Wolf Bruce and Anna Palmer Draper, um, we're working on bios for them as well, um, in addition to the, the women that did more of the computer work. Um, so those will be replaced right now. I think they linked to their Wikipedias. Um, and below that, by order of given name, we have 141 women listed out. Now the ones that are in bold are the ones that we have completed uh, bios for. So for instance, where's the one we were using as an example? Periscopopolis, Dorothy W. Block Periscopopolis. There she is. So there she is. This is when she worked uh, for the Yerkes Observatory. And this is her bio. So we have name and information, publications. Not everybody has publications um, and not everybody has publications just for themselves. Um, and then of course, citations of where we got all of our information. Um, at this point, we have about 37 completed bios uh, with an additional five that were already in existence on the Wolbach website when we started. Um, folks like Annie Jump Cannon and Selena, uh, <laughs> um, Wilhelmina Fleming and those, those women um, already had bios in existence. Um, so let's see, what was the next thing I was gonna do? Oh, um, I was gonna ask, and I don't know if Meta wants to jump in on this part or not. I don't know if she's just listening, but um, we were gonna uh, talk you guys through a little bit of where we got like the information for the bios. Where did we research? Um, for random information about, you know, where did they grow up and how did they get started at Harvard and things like that. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Here we go, hello. Um, I don't know if Elizabeth, do you wanna go first? You want me to go first? Uh, sure, I can go first. Um, so I um, did a lot of searching um, with old newspapers. So a lot of times there were profiles of women in newspapers or, I mean, everything from like marriage announcements and birth announcements to like, they were in this high school play um, to articles about their career as astronomers, um, things like that. So newspaper articles were helpful. And then there's also a lot of um, histories that have been written over time about the Harvard College Observatory that I used. And then also in terms of the actual publications, I tried to in the bios write a little bit about not just when they worked, but like what they were working on. Like they were interested in, you know, stars in the small Magellanic cloud or something like that. And so from there, I looked at their publications or um, through Phaedra, the logbooks that we have digitized with their names on them, um, looked at what they're working. And then Sam, Sam is the census guru. So you could talk about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, as part of this project, we've been working on um, figuring out exactly what terminology and why we use that specific terminology to talk about these women, right? You saw before I did computers, because um, you know computers as a term has a long history and it has different implications in terms of what work they were doing and, and how they were being compared to their male counterparts at, at the uh, Harvard College Observatory. Um, so in part of that project uh, and in part of the research for the bios, uh, I've been doing a ton of ancestry hunts to find um, census records, city directories, uh, marriage records, um, passenger manifests, all uh, passport applications, all kinds of things that, that ancestry has digitized. Um, in part to find out how they self-identified what their job title was, right? Did they call themselves an astronomer, a computer, an assistant, a star cataloger, was kind of a fun one. Um, and so that's been a major source of just bio uh, biographical and genealogical 
information for them. You know, where did they grow up and, and how many siblings did they have and things like that? Where did, you know, when did they get married? How many kids did they have? Things like that. Um, other sources we've, we've been using, you mentioned newspapers. Um, Cambridge has a huge newspaper archive that's available online, um, as well as like the New York Times has their Times machine. Um, a couple of autobiographies. Um, Cecilia Pingaposhkin has a fantastic autobiography that um, one of her children, I think her daughter, added to after the fact. Um, so that's, a, that's been a fantastic source for like firsthand information and things that were, people were working on. Um, there was a great story about Evelyn Leland, uh, who's one of the women on our, on our list, uh, who had never ridden in a car before. And so <laughs> she got her first car ride and liked it, enjoyed it immensely, things like that. Um, there have been a couple of encyclopedias that have been really helpful to us. Um, the Encyclopedia of women in the 20th century, uh, astronomers specifically, um, the Encyclopedia of Astronomers by Springer, um, the uh, Astronomical Database System. Is that what ADS stands for, Katie? I can't remember uh, what ADS is. Yeah, there. yeah <laughs> NASA ADS yeah. Uh, has been enormously helpful in not only what publications they've, like, what did they put out as publications themselves, but also annual reports by both um, the Mariah Mitchell Association and the Harvard College Observatory in the Annals um, for things that they were working on. So if there was a fellow there for a year or two, Annie Jump Cannon would talk about what she's working on and what the fellows are put, you know, when are their papers getting published and things like that. Um, so as much as we can, we've tried to find, you know, firsthand or at the time sources for a lot of the information. Um, and then I've learned quite a bit about uh, HTML uploading onto websites just to get everybody formatted and in place. Um, so everybody on that page you saw that wasn't bolded has a little page that says what years they were at Harvard. So if we know kind of around, you know, they were here for two years or they were here for 50 years. Um, and then kind of a stay tuned thing. We plan to do BIOS for everybody um, get as much information, you know, up, up and out there for people to see about this. Um, last thing I had on my thing was um, kind of superlatives, our, our favorite things to have found and funny stories and things. Um, I can start that. When I was going through the city directories uh, to find, you know, where are they living and what are they listing their job title as in just a phone book before a phone book, um, there were several misspellings of observatory. Uh, so it would say like their name is spelled correctly and then their address is fine, but it would say things like abursuratory or uh, absurditory. And then the one I found this morning was absorva absorvatory. So with an O instead of an E at the beginning. Um, it's always fun to find misspellings in official and historic documents. So <laughs> um, yeah. I would say, yeah, I would say one of the things that I think is super interesting, it's the sort of expeditions that they went on um, for astronomical reasons. So um, Ruth Poulter Bailey, um, who is the husband of Solon Bailey, or the wife of Solon Baby Bailey, who I mentioned earlier, but also did astronomical work mm -hmm. in her own right. Um, she was with the early party to uh, locate our final location for our Harvard station in Arequipa, Peru. So there's diaries of like her and her four-year-old son and like like a bunch of like random dogs on the top of a hill just sort of walking around. And so she not only helped with the observatory stuff, like the observing, the meteorology, meteorology stuff but she was also sort of holding down a household of paper houses you know in some rural place where she didn't speak the language um, which I thought was interesting and then also eclipse expeditions they'd go on very elaborate expeditions to see eclipses um, and there was one that involved them going through the Soviet Union um, and sort of I forget what the year was I think 52 or something and um, very interesting um, traveling, you know, over camel. And there's this great um, photo of Henrietta Hillswope sitting on a camel, like socializing with Soviet astronomers. 
So yeah, I thought those things were fun. There was a story about, I can't remember who, and maybe you do, Elizabeth. Uh, Cecilia Pinkaposhkin took a road trip to California in like the 1930s when there was not, there were no paved roads past like St. Louis or something. Um, and so they had to like camp out and they were in their car and they were, um, they made it all the way to, I think it was Mount Wilson, maybe? They made it all the way to an observatory in California. And then the observatory folks still wouldn't, like you can't camp on that mountain. Um, so they could go and visit and say hi to everybody, but then they had to like leave and go camp off the mountain um, and then, you know, drive home all the way. Um, I thought that was a really fun story. It's, CPG talks about it in her autobiography. I, I'm kicking myself. I can't remember who goes with her. But yeah. Um, yeah, and also Cecilia Payne-Kaposchkin was quite the character, and she has a lot of very funny descriptions of the other women, you know, some of which are appropriate to include in the bios and some are not, you know, <laughs> but she was very candid. Critiques and, of her coworkers. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it was very funny, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited. Um, some of the bios of the, the donors, I think we have Lizzie Sparks Pickering is up. Um, it was very cool reading about, um, you know, because she was sort of first lady of the Harvard College Observatory while her husband was the director. And so, you know, what, what she got up to and how much of a master gardener she was, she was all over that. Yeah. And also a lot of times, like the wives of the director were really instrumental in like having gatherings of students and organizing, you know, visits from other astronomers and stuff like that. So we're very involved in the sort of technical side more than you would think. Um, but yeah, Lee Sparks Pickering is interesting. And then there's also, yeah, the female benefactors, um, Anna Palmer Draper and Catherine Wolf Bruce were both people who um, contributed a lot um, to the observatory financially and sponsored. Um, Anna Palmer Draper sponsored the Draper catalog of stars, which a lot of the women worked on. And Catherine Wolf Bruce sponsored the Bruce Telescope. Um, that was in Arequipa and I believe is soon going to be on display in an exhibit at the Smithsonian in DC, the Bruce Telescope. So yeah, so those people are really interesting too. I know we went a little fast, Katie. If anybody needs me to repeat any sections or you want me to go back to the spreadsheet or the website or something. Because um, after this, I guess it was open for folks questions, things you're curious about. Um, you know, I don't know if you and, and Cindy had any questions for us. Yeah, I've got a question, but I also have a, just a kind of a comment, like, even though I've seen the list of names before, something about how you were talking about them, it just sort of kind of struck me in a new way, like the kind of the, the, the sense of the enterprise of the work, right? Like, you know, when, when I think about the women computers, I mostly think of, of course, like the most well-known names, and it just seems like, um, like maybe there's only a few of them at a time working and it just seemed like a small, not a small result, but like, like a more solitary endeavor, but seeing all the names and like how long some of them had worked there. And I was, I was clicking on some of the names that didn't have bios yet, you know, and like Nellie Storin and you know, she was here for over 10 years, looks like about 11 years. And um, it's like, I never even heard the name before. So again, it just gives me a sense of just how massive the the work was and the endeavor and how many people were involved with it over time and i think that's just really great to think about um but i did have a question so um so could you tell us a little bit about, about which um if, if you're working on any particular um bios for any of these people at the moment and also like how do you pick who you do your next deep dive on Elizabeth, do you want to take that one first? How do you pick? Sure. Well, I tend to, um, so I've done a lot of reading through um, like observatory histories and then marking which women were there. And then, but a lot of times it's sort of like a rabbit hole. Like you're reading about one person and she mentioned someone else and you're like, oh, that person sounds super interesting. So I feel like it's always that I stumble across a reference to someone and I'm like, that person sounds interesting. And then like, the more you read about them, the more interesting they are. So yeah, that's usually how I, <laughs> how I pick, so. 
I've been picking in the past folks that have been here the longest, um, in part because I feel like it'll be slightly easier to find things like census records and stuff like that for them to, to confirm that they were here and to, to um, figure out exactly what they were working on. Um, but there have been times where, you know, it was easier to find what somebody was doing who was here for two years than it is to find somebody who was here for 60 years because she was just there. She was doing her work. It wasn't anything remarkable. Whereas somebody who was there for two years, it was like, she's here and she's doing this thing. It's very cool. Um, there was a first part to your question that wasn't, how do we pick? That was. Oh, a little bit more about, like you tell us about the people you're researching currently. Right now. You know, who, you, who are you working on right now? Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't have anybody in the works at the moment. I've been working on um, a lot more of that terminology stuff. And so it's been kind of uh, a little bit of everybody to figure out what they call themselves in census records and things like that to get kind of broader data for them. Um, but we just put up, I think I just put four of them in two weeks ago uh, that Meta and Elizabeth had finished up or Elizabeth, I think had finished. So I am working currently on um, Priscilla Fairfield Bach, who is an interesting person. Um, yeah, she was, Bart Bach was sort of a big name in um, the Harvard College Observatory um, in the sort of 40s and 50s, but she was an astronomer before she married him. Um, but yeah, she's an interesting person. Um, I'm trying to just get up my little thing that I've written about her so far. Sometimes we'd but, start yeah. off like, you know, pick a person and see how far, you know, see how much you can find about them. And then they end up being like, oh, this was actually a really cool person. <laughs> like she did some really cool stuff, you know. And Arvo I Walker also discovering Pluto and things like that. Yeah. No, and I also um try to do people who were here earlier or here longer too, because a lot of those sort of, especially earlier, they just like got less recognition, but were really committed, like really, really dedicated, like the Winlock sisters, mm -hmm. um, people like that. So. Yeah. Um, and of course, I mean, there's gonna be folks on our list that, you know, maybe they were here two to five years, maybe they did one or two cool things, or they worked on part of a longer project, and then they went off to be a mom, and that's pretty cool too. But their bio is going to be short because, you know, they didn't make any grand discoveries or publish a catalog or something, but, you know, everybody's going to get a bio, whether it's five pages long, well, not five pages long, but <laughs> whether it's, you know, a significant amount of information that we were able to find on them, or they were here and they helped us, and then they went on to other things. Because um, some women went off to be astronomers in other places, and some went off to be moms. I went to your uh, uh, page with the list of names and I did a rough count, it was about 140. Mm -hmm. That's, that was amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, at what point do you stop uh, making the list? What year was there a cutoff or do you include yourselves? Uh, <laughs> um, we haven't included ourselves because um, we, we qualify as curatorial assistants as opposed <laughs> to computers. The, the and work also, is it cut off, I think, 1950 when I was doing the list. I cut it off at 1950. Mm -hmm. So I think the earliest women were 1875. And then, yeah. yeah. We just added um, the curator before. So yeah, so she's later. Yeah. We, yeah, there have been okay. two acting curators and then a full and then two full time curators. And then we added the woman that was before those four because um, she was kind of the the transitionary period between when this was a like a technical collection right this is a these are scientific tools and these are you know we're just going to take them off the shelf and use them and write on them and things like that the transition from that to being a historical collection and being more uh, uh archives minded as opposed to um you know having them be tools in that way if that makes sense you know they're still they're still being used as tools, they're still being scanned and all of that for, for Dash, but um, thinking about them as a resource historic historically, um, in addition to scientifically. Um, she was kind of the, the, the last curator of the scientific E part. 
and we could, you know, go later. It's mostly just, you know, 140 is a lot of people. So that was a somewhat arbitrary cutoff. That was also about the time where um, women who were getting, who were learning astronomy, studying astronomy at Harvard, went from studying it at Radcliffe to studying at Harvard. That was about 1950, that cutoff. So, yeah. And if we find more women that worked here, you know, in the 1920s, we'd add them to the list. 140 isn't a maximum as much as it had dates on either. It had a, a temporal uh, cutoff. Um, so, you know, there's, I think we have, there's only 140 on that list. I have 142 written down here because we've added one or two that I haven't been able to put in the website yet. But um, I think at one point, a previous curator's list, so it's something like two, Lindsay's list, I think was something like 260. You know, it was up in the, the high. Yeah, numbers. it was really long. And one thing that was interesting is she even included like domestic workers, like people who she only knew the first name of. Um, yeah, so. It was women in all capacities. At yeah, and it was, just the computers. I think it was published like Journal of History of Astronomy, but you can definitely find it online, um, mm -hmm. her article, it's interesting. Oh, the other really good source uh, that we've been using, Deva Sobel's book, Glass Universe, uh, you guys know of that one, um, has been a really great resource, both like who do we add to our list, but also stuff about them and, and stories like the Eva Leland uh, car riding story, things like that, um, and what folks were working on. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, I'm just curious, like, um, where this work with the bios crosses over with your work, like, with the plates? Um, mainly with uh, things like the markings and the jackets and the logbooks. Um, cause their, you know, initials and names and, and information shows up on them that has people's names on them, right? There's a, a, a there was a project going on to fig to find all of the initials that were written on lots of plate jackets and, and plates themselves, um, and matching those, um, matching those two people, uh, on our list initial wise, right? There's one or two people that we still only have initials for, um, RW Gifford, I think is one of them. Um, and so it overlaps when, you know, uh, not just the, not the Phaedra logbooks, the other ones, the ones that are in here, um, that have, you know, this was somebody's daily workbook that she used to do her calculations in. And so we want to make sure she's on our list because clearly she was here and she was doing stuff. So just briefly, in addition to the Phaedra notebooks, which is what we have in the transcription center, there was a collection of log books, um, which Samantha was just talking about that, as she said, just the, the daily work of, of actually observing and taking note of what's, um, what the telescopes are looking at and, and the, 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 the exposure lengths and all of that. That's what you meant, right? Those are the log books, yeah. which um, those are all, I think most of them or many of them, are, you actually can find in the Smithsonian Transcription Center mm -hmm. under Project Phaedra still, um, even though they're not technically part of Project Phaedra. Uh, they're still there. If you look at the completed notebooks, you'll see a whole run of these log books. Yeah, those we've pulled those out before to, you know, check calculations and things that have shown up on, on plate jackets and stuff like that. But, you know, the names that appear that they were, that, they were clearly here and we can find a record of them. And so it's important that we find out, okay, well, who is this person and what else was she working here on and what else was she doing and things like that, so. Mm -hmm. so I've got a whole uh, bunch of questions. That's really, really interesting presentation. Thank you so much. Um, a bunch of questions about sources. So. You know, I, I know a bunch of them have been to the same colleges, Vassa, Wesley, Radcliffe. Mm -hmm. um, do the records at those colleges have information that may be of use? Um, I've mostly used them for dates of when they went, like a kind of, um, you know, alumni list or something. Um, sometimes they'll show up in, you know, if they were part of a, an astronomy club or things like that. A couple of people have been 
um, I know somebody graduated from a school and then worked there as part of their astronomy department. Um, so the, the records that are available, as far as we've used them, have been either double checking or confirming and like being the information or double checking the information from some other source. Um, Oh. Also, Meta. I mean, Meta. If you want to unmute and jump yeah. in and talk about this Meta yourself, that's talking, fine. That awesome but Radcliffe source. Yeah, she got. Um, yeah. Great. Can you can you guys hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay. Uh, yes, I did. Um, actually, sort of going in a different direction than um, uh, Sam and Elizabeth. I tend to choose people that have only been at the college for a few years and have very little information because I like to do a deep dive. I like rabbit holes. So um, recently I've been working on Marion Hawes and she did attend Radcliffe and then later taught at Vassar. So I we didn't have much information on her and there wasn't much I could find online. So I did go to the Radcliffe archives and pull her student files. And there was a great amount of information there. A lot of correspondence with her, uh, her um, not her transcripts, more uh, informal information about the classes she took, uh, information about her. Um, I also went to the Harvard archives and looked through correspondence. Um, they have the records of Shapley and other um, directors. So there's correspondence um, after Hawes left. Uh, she kept in contact. Uh, she was very um, desperate to get positions. This was the late 20s and early 30s. So the country was in economic turmoil and she sort of is chronicling her life through a lot of letters. So that was really useful. And I've also reached out to other colleges, uh, Salem State. Uh, we had a few of at least one of the computers who went there for her undergraduate degree. They had some records for her and also contacting uh, local libraries. Uh, unlike uh, Cambridge's really prevalent digitized newspaper collection. A lot of communities don't have theirs digitized. So I've reached out to a few local libraries as well and found those very useful for information. But yeah, the, the Radcliffe archives uh, have been a really great source so far. Do, do you think that a number of these women were actually connected as, as alumni, that there was actually a network that could, that could be sort of revealed here or there was definitely a lot of um connection between the women both socially and professionally especially because a lot of them did their undergrad studies at the colleges you mentioned you know Vassar or Mount Holyoke Smith and um when you start researching a lot of the women taught like the next generation of women like they were her undergraduate astronomy professor and stuff. So um, yeah, I mean, I guess we haven't seen, we haven't looked up like formal documented um, networks, but it definitely was sort of a, like they, a lot of them are in contact with each other. There's like letters from one to the other or like things like that. So um, yeah, both educationally and professionally and then socially, they definitely were very interconnected. Yeah. Some of them that went on to work other places in the astronomy field. I'm thinking of um, Margaret Harwood, who became the director mm -hmm. of the um, an observatory on Nantucket. Um, she facilitated a program where women would work both at the plate stacks, but also would go and work at her telescope for you know a summer or six months or something. Um, and so they were not only part of the network; they were very active in building up you know, building it out and, and adding more people and, and giving women opportunities where there wouldn't be them otherwise. And um, for the first master's degrees given out um, by the observatory in the 20s, um, they had funding that through a fund that was specifically for supporting women in astronomy. Um, and that's how the, the first funding they had for master's students. So to get his first master's students, um, I forget which director this was, but they reached out specifically to women's colleges, to astronomy departments and women's colleges. And that's how they got um, Adelaide Ames was the first one. And then still Vassar is definitely one of those. Yeah, Vassar, Vassar, Mount Holyoke were sort of the, definitely like bastions of a lot of them taught and, you know, did summer things and studied there.
Judge, you had a long list. Are there more? Oh, yeah. Okay. So <laughs> in question of sources, uh, sorry, that was a really interesting answer. I was uh, listening and uh, forgotten where I was in question. Um, in, in, in terms of primary sources, um, human resource records, payroll records, Harvard, do, do they add anything to the picture? So I have been endeavoring to go and look at Harvard employment records for a while. Um, the two collections that exist, um, at least one of them is not arranged chronologically. And between, uh, there has to be, you have to get permission for anything within, I think, 70 years uh, for employment records for Harvard. Um, so I have to track down not only our direct director, the Harvard College Observatory director, but the director of the CFA in order to get permission to go and look at these records. So I intend to go and look, and I think they're going to be an awesome, awesome source for both the job title stuff, right, terminology, how did they, what was their job title on paper, and then how does that compare to what they listed, um, but also things like dates and, you know, how did they spell their name and things like that. Um, so that is in the works, but <laughs> it's been a little bit of an endeavor. Okay. The, the, the last question was similar to the first one about uh, the network via the colleges, um, and that was networking via uh, professional associations like, well, or associations like the AAVSO mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on. Um, to what extent does that figure in establishing connections between these women? Mm -hmm. Um, the AAVSO, I think, played a, a pretty big part. Um, a number of women went on to work at the AAVSO um, after mm -hmm. their, their tenure in the stacks. Um, and so I think there was definitely an aspect of, you know, they're, they're creating a space for women in, in the field and, and helping find opportunities and um, going on to have both professional careers in the AAVSO, but also to be members and to, to you know, work in conjunction with the AAVSO um, definitely played a part. And a lot of them, a lot of them definitely attended conferences and um, things like that. There's a lot of records of people doing that. And, but the AAVSO in particular, um, I was actually, I just, I have a thing here, women in the history of variable star astronomy. Um, but yeah, the variable star sort of crowd was definitely, there's definitely a lot of women that were involved in that. And I believe who I call Henrietta one and two, Henrietta Levitt and um, Henrietta Swope were the, the two biggest variable star discoverers. They both discovered more than 2000 variable stars. So here, wait, I have the, oh. yeah. And then Dora Hofflet was at 1300 and Emily Hughes Boyce at 1200. So those are the biggest variable star observers, but um, yeah. And then also there's a um, interesting article by Dorit Hofflet that's called Four Helens. That's talking about four people named Helen that were involved. I believe they're all involved in the AVSO. Um, yeah. Yeah, and the journals, yeah, so it was done for the 70th anniversary of the AAVSO, the, the Four Helens article. And plus the records of, of associations like that and the, the, the old, um, like the, um, yeah, the records um, have been really great sources for the bios themselves, because a lot of them have done, if they were really, you know, involved in the AAVSO, uh, often they will have published an obituary for them. And that will have things that they did not only, you know, they were here at Harvard, but, and then they had this illustrious career with the AAVSO and they did all of these things and were very well loved and things like that. Um, and that also is great for some of those, you know, first time in a car type of stories, because um, they'll have, it'll be written by people who knew them. And a lot of the, there's plenty of obituaries that were written by one of the other women, like one of the, early, you know, later generation women, which I think is yeah. cool. We'll find those in the 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 annual reports and things like that of the director's yeah. reports and things. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure thing. Are there any other? Mm -hmm.
Oh, okay. sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to ask, you may have already answered this. I think you maybe did, but I was just wondering like which sources you usually find those like fun stories, those like personal stories about the women. I think, I mean, it varies. Um, a lot of the autobiographies are things and a lot of the obituaries that are written by someone who knows them. Um, but also the the newspaper articles, like there's a certain number of like, it'll be like a profile on someone. And some of the women were just very chatty. Like <laughs> Helen Sawyer Hogg was very chatty and just, you know, very funny. And there's like these whole things with her, you know, giving quotes about stuff. So I would say it tends to be the non-official ones, like the autobiographical or the um, obituaries, some of them written by the long ones that are written by someone they knew or like some of these interesting like newspaper profiles where they you know were interviewed by a journalist things like that but there's also for some of the later people there is oral histories like I did a bio on May Kafton Kasim and she had an oral history that it was a recording of a meeting in DC it was sort of a 20-minute recording where she was specifically talking about her time at the Harvard College Observatory um which was interesting It must be really exciting when you find like the thing you've been looking for, like the, the piece of information that you dreamed you would find. That's really cool. It's pretty satisfying. You know, especially things like, you know, the simple stuff like their birthday or something. It's like finally found it, you know, even if it's just a year. New England Historical Genealogical Society. Just beautiful. For sure, yeah. Um, we haven't reached out as of yet because most of the things that we've been able to find, sorry, I'm talking to the person who just commented, um, put something in the chat. Um, we haven't specifically reached out as of yet. We've been able to find um, most of the information we've been looking for, um, especially because um, I didn't really talk about this when I opened the bio, but um, our structure for writing the bios has started with like, that kind of sentence you'd read at the beginning of a Wikipedia, right? This person was born, you know, born and died from here to here and had these titles over their career. And then we've been focusing on their work at the Harvard College Observatory. So like, what did they specifically work? How many variable stars did they discover? Things like that. Um, and then their work in the field outside of Harvard. So if they went on to be a director or an astronomer somewhere else, um, if they just you know, went on to be the treasurer at the AVSO or something. Um, their work professionally in, usually in the field elsewhere, publications, things like that. And then more genealogical. So where did they grow up and where did they go to school and things like that, genealogical, biographical. Um, most of that is available online. We haven't had any sort of like great mysteries, um, but possibly in the future we, we could reach out because uh, they're, like I said, there's going to be women that we just can't find that much on. Um, and so for what I'm, what I'm not able to find through um, census and directory records on ancestry would be good to find out, you know, if, if the, if there's a way to find more. Yeah. So I have a question, which may, maybe uh, the, the issue was actually raised by Sydney in a, in a, email thread uh, earlier this year. Um, are you thinking of putting this list up on Wikipedia, which I know might not be what you're thinking of, but that is most people's go-to source when they want to find something out? Yeah, the list itself, I'm not sure, but there has been there has been talk of, up, of the women that already have Wikipedia pages for them, people like Amy Jump Cannon, um, who has like a really comprehensive one, um, if we find information or we, you know, establish a source on something that's, okay, something in the Wikipedia isn't quite right, or, you know, especially with all of the terminology conversations, how do we want people to be talking about them um, as kind mm -hmm. of the, the, the caretakers of, of this collection and this information? Um, I think, I think it would be super cool for some of the women who were less you know, less talked about um, to have pages. There are a lot of regulations about who can edit a Wikipedia page. Like you can't, I think that we maybe have a conflict of interest 
of some sort, like you can't be paid to edit a Wikipedia page. So there's things like that, but um, there's also organizations that, I know there's one for women artists that like helps bring in volunteers to help update the Wikipedia pages and you can like send in a request and things like that. So it's a good idea, we should look into that. But yeah. there are like weird, yeah. regulatory things in terms there's of been her. weird rules and the other thing is we have like i said 140 something 140 odd women that you know only maybe 15 ish that might be generous have wikipedias i'd have to go and double check that but um it would be creating a ton of new pages and then being like the the, the sources that we find would be all of the sources on the page to start off with um, and that, that is, is something we still need to have in conversation for sure. It's not out of the picture, but it's a little bit farther in the future, I think. Um, you know, getting the information is, is first and foremost to updating it somewhere else. I know that I made a post on Star Notes about that, about asking if anybody was a Wikipedia editor or something like that. So I may have done that prematurely because it's still in the works, but um, yeah, thanks for bringing it up. Leah. No, that would be great. Yeah, because if someone volunteers to do it, they're able, so. Oh, yeah. okay. So then yeah, you could, someone can volunteer to do it if they're not like directly affiliated. Mm -hmm. Okay. But. <laughs> The, the, the problem with the list, right, is unfortunately Wikipedia is full of lists and some of them are not very good, right? Yeah. Um, but, but you know, your list is golden. <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a sense in which actually it might be a really useful addition to Wikipedia, uh, giving at least an index into um, into those other biographies that are in Wikipedia and at least give people a sort of entrance to the whole space. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, we really want this to be a resource for people, um, you know, both research and somebody's third grade science project. You know, the, the thing where you go to, I, I, I remember having a project, I think it was in second grade and it was a Halloween time of year and so they had us do uh you pick a historical figure and you do a pumpkin of that person and you do a whole little research project so things like that where like this information can be accessible to more than just you know really academic researchers it, it can be accessible to, to, to large groups of people and wikipedia is one way of doing that for sure i mean a potential start could be someone <laughs> interested in making a small edit to Wikipedia could just even add a link at the bottom to the external links um, to the page on our website that lists the women right now. I mean, right now there's just a link, an external link to um, Pickering's harem. So adding another another item there, you know, would might be a good idea, someone to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that would be really good. And that would that at least put your list yeah. in the sort of click path of people who are interested but i do think sam is with the right like we can't really do that as ourselves because we are employed at harvard and so we're so clo we're close to the subject so we do have that kind of bias um but we can suggest it be done i think <laughs> and of course there's the idea that while wikipedia is everybody's go-to source like we would like to be the go-to source for this, right? Yes. So yeah. you don't necessarily want to update somebody else's page with your own inf your own information. Um, so there's there's that aspect to it, right? We want people to, to come and find the information on our website and then click to other pages on the website, right? Get curious about our the library itself. Um, and so there's there's some there's that level to it. I mean. Talking, I mean, so, you know, this is, oh, I guess, has become the golden list. Um, what, what, what ideas do you have around the sustainability of this information over the long term? So it remains, in a, you know, an important archive in the history of science and so on. So at the moment, um, as we've been putting up the information on this website, because this, the Wolbeck website has changed even just within the last you know it's been restructured a little bit and the 
the plate stacks being becoming a special collection of the library has you know adjusted things um, both internally and on on the website and I think uh, as as far as keeping this information we're not in danger of losing it it's not, you know even if it's not even if it's being moved around on the website it's not going it's not going to be lost within our archives we're backing up you know all of the information that gets put even the source code itself um, has been well thanks for coming um, somebody's chat um, the uh, each different page that gets uploaded each bio um, its source code and all of the text for it um, is being backed up so we can move it around and we can we can have it be a source in and of itself for that information um, and all of our research we're, we're keeping track of and keeping organized so all right i uh, i think we're gonna have to end it there because it's getting to be about three o'clock um but thank you both for you know coming here and, and discussing this and telling us all about your work it's been really interesting and really great to hear so yeah thank you guys Thanks for inviting us. Thanks this for was really fun. Us. Yeah, thank you for your questions too. Yeah, and thank you for, for everyone for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, well, have a good afternoon. You too. Thank you guys.